This week I start, uh, we start a new series called Fake News. Fake News. And um, thank you for that. Usually I'll, I'll say something purposely funny and no one laughs, so i gotta take, I got to take any of them. And we'll just appropriate it later to, to whatever it needs to be. Um, I know we've prayed a bunch uh, today, but let's, let's pray again if you don't mind for... Um, Lord, I, I know that you have... Lord, you have begun probably even before we've come into the room today. Lord, become kind of breaking up the soil of our own hearts. Lord, preparing us, even though we might not have known to be prepared or wanted to be prepared, but to prepare us to receive your word, your truth. And Lord, I pray today that, that your seed and your spirit Lord, would drive it deep into our hearts and begin, Lord, growing something new in there. Lord, pulling up some old stuff that doesn't need to be there. Lord, and planting the new stuff that needs to be. Father, we, we try to live life on our own. It just it doesn't work out real well. This morning, Lord, we're surrendered to you. Thank you for your grace and that we can come running to the Father and that your arms are open wide, regardless of what we think they are, regardless of how the enemy convinces us on how they are. They're open wide for us. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. When you enter fake news into Google, you get a billion, 330 million hits and a paltry 0.41 seconds. Plenty to read about fake news. Here is, here is Wikipedia's definition of fake news. It's also known as junk news or pseudo news. It's a type of yellow journalism or propaganda that consists of deliberate disinformation or hoaxes spread via traditional news media or online social media. You know, it's one thing to get a story wrong. It's, it's another thing um, when, when you, you get it wrong because you're trying to put forward a certain agenda. Earlier in my life, when a news organization got a story wrong, they would retract it with the same kind of energy or emotion in which they had given the original story. Now, they'll bury it in the back of a paper near a mattress sales circular, and, and the retraction will sound more like, well, the story felt true. <laughs> there was enough of the story that we wanted it to be true, but it just wasn't ready for broadcast, is what they might say. There's a particular radio personality I listen to quite a bit, and he says that media bias isn't what they tell you, is what they don't tell you. It's what they don't tell you. Truth used to be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me. Now, truth is a little bit, a little bit more relative. It's, it's um, when we get the whole truth, though, it seems like we get the whole picture, and when we get the whole picture, we go, oh, oh, that's what that is. The central reason of why truth is no longer the truth is what can be known as the postmodern culture. The postmodern culture that has elevated personal experience to the level of truth. It defines fact. My, that's why how I can have my truth and you can have your truth is because my experience is different than your experience. And, and we've, we've elevated then experience and feelings. We've elevated that above, we as the culture, above truth. The breakdown of truth didn't happen overnight. We didn't wake up one day and have a, a hard time figuring out what's true. It's happened over time. A, a lie, when it's first told, is easily detected as a lie. But unless someone confronts it with the truth, then it will perpetuate itself. And there's kind of a saying that says if you repeat a lie long enough and you're, if you repeat a, a lie loud enough, then sooner or later you start to believe it. Now, contrary to what you might think, this introduction isn't going to launch me into an unending series on our political culture. Although I might, I might fit in a couple messages as it relates to the lies the culture tells us and the truth that the kingdom tells us. But more about what are the lies that you and I hear in our own minds about us. The lies that unless they become um, confronted with truth, they will repeat 
over and over again and louder and louder again. It starts changing our filter of how we experience people, how we experience experience. And it starts shading us and changing us in a matter that even though it's not true, it has moved past feeling true. It actually is starting to come true. And so that's how I'm framing this idea of fake news, where the enemy takes something that could be a little true or has a, a little twinge of experience to it and then starts building this own castle to this lie that we end up moving out of God's kingdom and we start taking up residence in that castle. I want to talk about where those lies come from and I want to introduce us to the truth that drowns them out. The most effective lies are the ones that do resemble some kind of truth and ones that end up getting told to us with conviction. But although that, that, that becomes an effective nature of a lie, there is only one place where a, the power of a lie rests. The impact of a lie will always rest with us. And you need to remember this throughout this entire series, this idea. The impact of a lie is dependent on what I do with it. A lie that is not believed and not act, acted upon is lifeless. It has no power of its own. We are the ones that give lies life. An ignored lie, when we just ignore a lie and we try to push it back, an ignored lie is just a deterred lie. It's going to surface again. Anybody have lies in your life that, that are have seemingly on this cycle of repeat? Anybody? So, so it, just pushing down a lie doesn't take it off of the repeat cycle. The only thing that will destroy a lie is truth. Not just ignoring it, not pushing it back, but wrestling that puppy to the ground until you beat it. Now, the truth, the truth is what defeats it. And I, and I wrote this. On the, I don't know if I've got it on there, but on the contrary, truth is God-powered. Truth is God-powered. The power rests in what he says. But it's an interesting corollary because just like a lie has no impact until I believe it and I act on it, the truth of God doesn't have power in my life until I believe it and act on it. But it contains, it contains the power, but it's interesting. Unless I apply it, it doesn't fit me either. I use this illustration about three years ago when I, when I, I bought my new driver and um, a dr golf club. And um, I don't buy new golf clubs often, when, but when I do buy them, they're expensive. And, and I, was, I, was, I was wrestling that with the guy selling me the golf club. He said, when's the last time you bought a driver? And I said, I think it's been eight years. He said, well, divide this cost by eight, and, and then it's easier to swallow. And I said, you're right. And I went and bought it. <laughs> But at the time, it was the most, one of the most advanced drivers on the market. The technology had changed, so the, the alloys changed, and you could adjust it in more than the seats of my car. And, and, but what's interesting, though, is still, if I'm getting to the tee box and I'm one degree off in my aim, the ball is going to end up somewhere where I don't want it to go. If the loft is one degree change, it's going to change where the ball goes. If I'm one degree closed on the face, it's going to go left. If I'm one degree open to the right, it's going to go right. It didn't matter what that driver was made of. Still being off one degree mattered. Water at 211 degrees, you know what it is? It's just hot. It's really, really hot. But what is it at 212 degrees? It now can change from water, liquid, to gas. One degree matters. And that's why even just believing a half of a truth or half of a lie can have just as much impact on our lives, if, even if we're just one degree off. Several weeks ago, I asked you to tell me what lies circulate in your own brains. And, I mean, I got a stack of cards and emails. One was, one was particularly fascinating because it said, Pastor, you probably won't even get all of the responses that are out there because there are still too many lies being believed. I just, that's how I read that email. That there's still unexposed lies that are still having such an impact 
on us? Why do we allow lies to drive us? Even when we, even when we can point out that's a lie. I think we stick to a lie because it's been a so, so long, we've been so long around it that it just feels true. It just doesn't ever seem to go away. It might take a break every now and again. I think we stick with lies because we just don't know how to get unstuck. I mean, even when you point to that's a lie, if you don't have a truth to go to, you just have the ability to say that's not true, but you don't know what truth is. It's kind of a limbo. You kind of find yourself in the middle. I hope in this series that we'll identify as many core lies as I can. A core lie is um, something that Satan uses over and over and over and again, repackages it in all of our lives. He, he's not creative, but he is consistent. You get that? He's not creative. God is the creator, but he is consistent. And if he can find one little thing that works, you can be sure that he's going to package that thing up as many times as he can, put as many different clothes on it as he can to still come at us. We want to expose that lie's root system. We want to shine some light there. And then we want to water the truth. We want to water it and nurture it to develop a new root system. I feel like that all lies share a central purpose, to hide the truth so as to gain power. A lie is a weapon of control. There's going to be some one-liners in here that are worth writing down. That's one of them. A lie is a weapon of control. That's how it's being used. So where do lies come from? Regardless of where it appears the lie comes from, regardless of that, all lies have one central birthplace. Jesus, in having a confrontation with the Pharisees, says this in John 8, 44, the second half of that verse. He says he's speaking of Satan. He says he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of all lies. So all lies, no matter where we encounter them, have their origin in Satan. You've heard the old joke, how, do you, how can you tell if a politician is lying? <laughs> their lips are moving. How can you tell when Satan's lying? His lips are moving. The origin of all lies. Peter, Peter tells this in 1 Peter 5 and 8. Peter, Peter had believed lies. I, 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 love, I love that we can go to Peter to hear how we counteract the lies of the enemy because he was, he got hit with lies, smack dab in the face, his own, his own fault, right? I mean, he denies Christ going into the crucifixion, but then the lies he had to believe was, I'm done. How do I, how do I know that? Because it, Christ had to come back and restore him three different times. Christ comes back to restore Peter. The restoration is an indication that he was crushed. So, so, so what, it wasn't like the enemy dragged him into that action. He, he went willingly. But after he realized that it, was, that it was a wrong action and that Christ was real, he still couldn't get over how he had reacted. Why not? Because the enemy keeps pounding him with lies. It, it had been like the story that Pastor Chris read, that if the, if the, the, the prodigal, and this is a parable, okay, so this is an actual happening. Jesus is telling us a story to tell you how that he receives us when we come back. But it had been like the prodigal going, yeah, I'm done. There's no way dad's taking me back. I mean, all the stuff he worked for all his entire life, and I blew in a matter of months. Yeah. The lie then is how the father will react to the son returning. And unless that's getting confronted with the truth, it keeps you stuck. So this is, this is what Peter says. He says, be alert. Be alert. Be aware of. Be aware of his tactics. I used this example a couple months ago. Um, keep your head on a swivel. Know where the enemy comes from. Know, know what his tactics are on you. Each of us have our own kind of Achilles heels, the lies we are much more susceptible to believing than others. What are they? Write them down. Mark them out. Know what they are. He says, and be of sober mind. 
Be sober. Be well balanced. Be disciplined. It says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Um, being in South Africa multiple times, I got a chance to actually, actually watch lions on a hunt. And they're stealth. I mean, they, they are crouched down. They're coloring matches, the vegetation on the plain, until they gauge that they're within striking distance, that their speed can now overcome the speed of their prey. And until then, they just, they just crouch. They listen. Conversely, the weapon of lie is a weapon of control. The truth is an instrument of freedom. So in John 8, where Jesus says that this is the origin of lies, the first part of that chapter, he tells us this. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, if you abide in, if you follow, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. All right? So, so there's, the, there's the comparison. Near the end of John chapter 8, he's saying this is the father of lies. He is the originator of lies. And at the beginning of that chapter, he's saying it's truth that brings us freedom. And then when you keep reading in 1 Peter, Peter goes on to say in verse 9, resist him, resist the enemy, stand firm in the faith or stand firm in the truth. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Now, that seems to be a little strange commentary there. Endure the hardship because other people are having it hard too. It's like this misery loves company. I don't think that's what he's trying to get at. One of the things that lies do is they have a tendency to isolate ourselves. The, the, the woe is me. No one's enduring anything like I am. No one's as bad as I am. No one's as much of a failure as I am. No one's a screw up like I am. And I think what Peter's trying to draw his attention to here is that the enemy is after everyone and he uses the same tactics on everyone. So we need to be alert and be sober minded and resist those lies and realize that these lies aren't just new to us. But he's using these lies everywhere. And he says, the God of all grace, a God who gives us what we don't even deserve, he's called you into an eternal glory with Christ. And after you've suffered a little while, and we don't want to do that one, but after we've suffered a little while, hey, wrestling, I wasn't a wrestler. Wrestling and baseball were the only two winning sports at my high school, and I chose baseball. That idea of cutting weight, I didn't have enough to cut, my friends. I mean, I, I was on a milkshake diet, you know. What, how many ever milkshakes I could get in me, you know, to gain weight? And, but they got hurt wrestling. They got hurt. They chose to get in there to get hurt. That never made any, a lot of sense to me. But if I would ever get in a fight with any of those wrestlers, they would pound me in the ground. Why? Because they're stronger because of the fight. After you suffer a little while, he himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. How do we resist the lies of the enemy? We resist them with truth. So just like Peter is saying that the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom to devour, I, I love this gem. I learned this scripture out of the um, CLC group that I was in, men's group, for two years. We had to, we had to learn a scripture every Every day. I think this is the only one I memorized. <laughs> but it was a powerful course. Second Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. That's powerful. The enemy is restricted by time and space. God is not restricted by time and space. The enemy has to come up on me. But the eyes of the Lord, he's everywhere, all-knowing, all-powerful, is purposely seeking out those who will stand on the truth. So you can stand on the truth and still feel weak. The, the, the thing is, is our feeling isn't what is the determining factor of what's true or not. 
which is opposite of the culture. Culture is my feeling is truth. In the kingdom of God, that's not true. The truth is the truth. <laughs> it has no dependence on feeling. It has no dependence on circumstances. It is self-powered. It is itself. And so I, the Father is looking for those that are going to go, well, I don't feel this, but I'm going to stand on it. Well, I'm going to strengthen you. Why? Because you're standing on strength. And John 10 is our passage of Scripture for gateway. Thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life, more and better life than you ever dreamed of. He's drawn the contrast. This is what the enemy is after to do. And this is what he's after to do in, our, in the lies we believe. Steal, kill, and destroy. He's after control. God comes to bring freedom from that control. So here's just a little summation of the beginning part of the message. The power of, of a lie is in what we do with it. The origin of lies is Satan. The intent of a lie is control and destruction. The power of truth is inherent in the reality of Jesus. The impact in my life is in my acceptance of him. The intent of truth is freedom and life. Satan's origin as an archangel, as an angel of light, as kind of what's been classified in loose, in loose terms as the leader of worship in heaven, if you will. And Satan is cast out of heaven with a third of the angels because he leads a rebellion to redirect worship from God to him. So, so, so let's classify it this way. Satan had an identity problem. Lucifer's issue from the get-go was an identity problem specifically around worship. He wanted it, desired it. It wasn't meant for him. I, I, don't, I, I don't understand how that works and God creating angels. In the, I don't understand all that. Let's put that off over here for a little bit. Understand there was, there was a worship and identity. This was the problem. So doesn't it make sense that what he's still after, what he's still after is identities and worship. That he's after destroying identities and either thwarting worship to the truth and moving that worship anywhere else. We, we, find, that, we find that in Luke. We find it in Luke 4 that when, when Jesus comes to the age where it's time to begin this um, more open, this, this out in the open ministry, he identifies with sinners by being baptized. That's out of obedience to the Father and, and, and identifying with us in our sin. This, is, this was what was so important about his humanness, fully human. And then he is taken by the Spirit into the wilderness immediately, Scripture says, to be tempted by the, the enemy. And 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus fasts. There's no food involved. That's why we fast at the beginning of every year because it is an intimate connection with the Father when we do this. It's a tenacious chasing after God. And I believe this is where Jesus gets this main download of what the next three or so years is going to look like. And it's after this time the enemy comes at him with temptations. Now, we have a tendency to see this as not temptations because he's God. But it's a temptation. Or it wouldn't be called a temptation. It would have been called the three suggestions of Satan. <laughs> These weren't suggestions. These weren't alternative plans. These were temptations. And the temptations all dealt with Jesus' identity. All right, look at them. Jesus, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, identity. If you are the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. How does Jesus respond? It is written. He's using truth. It is written, man should not live by bread alone. Same with saying, if you're the son of God, if you really want to prove your identity, then use your power for yourself. Well, that's not why his power was given. It's not why he had the power. This would have been, this would have been a rejection of his identity. And he answers with the truth. Satan doesn't stop. 
The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. This is true. He was, he was the prince of the earth. He's, he's not, he's, he can only give away something that's yours. This was his to give away. If you worship me, it'll all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written. Answer with the truth. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There is no t- shortcuts to identity. There are no shortcuts to identity. The devil led him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for here. Now, now Satan's trying to use the word too. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it said, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Now, you can take anything out of context. You take it out of context, it's still not true. Jesus put it back in context. He was trying to even get Jesus to doubt who he was. When the devil had finished all he's tempting, he left him until an appropriate time. When I read that, I had forgotten that was in there. I hated that last part. Until an appropriate time, which means I'm always going to be susceptible to the enemy circling back to try out those lies again. passage goes on. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. I love this. Isaiah is one of the longest books in Scripture. Okay? It's like 60-some chapters. And he hands him the whole scroll. I mean, I know we got the whole Bible like this, but I can't imagine what the rolled up scroll of Isaiah could have looked like. Right? I mean, we go page to page. Scroll. You know, so how, do you, how do you fold this map back up, right? And he goes and he finds this passage. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He, he, has, he has anointed me to, to tell the truth. To proclaim the truth. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. To proclaim the truth to prisoners. The recovery of sight for the blind. He set to set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. (laughs) And then, as only he can, rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Kind of like his own drop the mic moment. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He went to Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign, Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Do you feel poor? Poor in spirit? Down? He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Do you have a broken heart? Have you done your best with spit and chewing gum to try to keep it together? To release from darkness the prisoners. Do you feel in the dark? Held captive something foreboding in your life? To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you have trouble believing that everything's going to be okay? That there's light at the end of the tunnel? Or do you walk through life waiting for the other shoe to drop all the time? To provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Ashes is is, is what this this generation of people would have put on when they were, they were so distraught, they, had, there was, they were out of all kinds of answers, and they would just sit in sackcloth and sit, put ashes on them, sit where coals had burned. 
And Jesus is saying, I offer a crown of beauty. The exact opposite of an unwashed face sitting with just tear stains. The oil of joy instead of mourning. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. All lies are disarmed and defeated with truth. It was last year I told you that I came to an understanding that all lies have their core in two main lies. God is not enough and you're not enough. And I found that to be more true than the day that it came out of my mouth. Satan does not have the ability to control circumstance. But he has the ability how we receive circumstance. How we respond to circumstance. And when he can get us believing that God is not enough for us or our circumstance, that is a lie that changes the trajectory of your life. When he can get us to believe that we are not enough. And by the way, even though there was a lot of nuances on some of the cards, and we're going to get to those nuances, but so many of them boil down to not believing that you're enough. And when you buy into that lie, it changes how you hear and see and receive everything. And it changes how you respond and react. How do you know when you're believing a lie? I started thinking through this. Is there a trigger? Is there a way that I know that I can look to that I'm believing a lie, a feeling? And I think I do. I think if you feel bound up and anxious... wound tight somewhere in there you're believing a lie I think if you're living under this dark cloud that nothing is ever going to work out for you I think that has a root in a lie If you feel like that your relationship with God is conditional, that somehow when, when you screw up, that there isn't, there isn't an open-armed access to the Father. You start feeling shamed. There's a lie. Because see, even when God will speak truth in us to discipline us, discipline is meant for reconciliation and correction. It's, it's, done out of, it's done out of love, not out of anger. Discipline's a good thing. We, we need God's word and his truth to discipline us because it keeps us from running out in front of the car at Home Depot. I still have flashbacks of Annie being really little, taken off from me, head to the doors at Home Depot on a Saturday and grabbing her right before a red Ford F-150 ran over she was disciplined. And then I just cried. Shame is completely different than being disciplined. Shame moves something from I failed to I'm a failure. It gets personal. Shame is personal. Discipline is, is related to an action or an event. It's not personal. Those feelings and probably a hundred more where I don't feel free in Christ, loved by him, up for the task, loved, in relationship. Somewhere down in there deep, there's some lies. We've got to root them out, wrestle them to the ground. Know where you're the most susceptible to his lies because somewhere in our past something was said or done probably by someone that we've loved very very much and they didn't necessarily they might not have even meant it they were probably dealing with their own lies but somehow those things take root and start shading everything else that we hear 
Pastor Harry is a big fan of an author named John Eldridge, and Eldridge talks a lot about the father wound, the father wound. And I can trace back in my own life things that I know my dad didn't, didn't intend for harm, but the enemy seized upon them and decided that he was going to make his living with me around those things. Although they might have the roots somewhere in the past, lies are only perpetuated by us agreeing with them. By us giving them room to breathe and run around in our heads. That's another one of the things to remember. That lies gain their power in us when we start agreeing with them. When we start giving it a little room, thinking that maybe that is true. And then when we begin doing that, then what happens is, again, everything we see, everything we hear starts going through that filter. So I want to end this message with telling you about one of my lies. So I had to, it really didn't take me a lot of time to grapple with this on how, how vulnerable I would be with you. Um, most of the time you tell me I'm pretty transparent that you can read me and um, there's always a danger of being a little bit too vulnerable with you. Um, it was just a little bit into 2018 and we were, we were pretty much, we were all in in terms of this building program. And it was, it was a lot. It was a lot to jump into. I, I underestimated the spiritual opposition personally. Because in my mind, I believe this is what God told us to do. And so generally when I get a plan and I believe God's told me to do something, I get after it with, with everything I got. But I, I did not anticipate sitting in a theater, watching a movie that most of you probably have seen and loved. In December 2017, a movie came out, a musical, and I love musicals. There's vulnerability for you. Uh, I love musicals. The Greatest Showman. Many of you probably saw it and loved the score and the music. I'm sitting there in the theater with Gina, just Gina and I, and there is a scene where Everything burns down, and he gets all this confrontation. And it was in one particular scene, I heard it as loud as I've heard anything in my own head my whole life. I heard, you're a fraud. It was, it was loud enough in my head that it shook me to my core. I tried to, I tried to shake it off, and I couldn't. I got up out of my seat. Went, went, went out just like normal, you know, he's going to the restroom. And went to the restroom, washed my hands, waited a few minutes, went back thinking that it would go away, and it didn't. It didn't go away. I didn't know what to do with it. I was actually embarrassed a little bit. I didn't, I didn't tell Gina for weeks. About a week in, I just I couldn't do anything with it. I was teaching a class at Lee University on church planting, and I would, I would I'd get there, and I'd hear, the, I'd hear the same voice, you're a fraud. What, what, what if these people, what if the university found out? And I'm like, found out what? I mean, I, there, was, there wasn't a lot of logic or truth to it. It was a lie. What if the thing, what if the thing shuts down tomorrow? Boy, some church plant teacher you are. I mean, it was It was weird. But man, it felt so unbelievably real. So I let a few, I've let a few close friends in, and of course, they're trying to speak truth into it. You know, they've known me a long time. They're trying to speak truth into it, and I'd be okay for a little while, but it would come back. What's interesting, the only time I could beat it was when I was prepping to preach. Because it, it wasn't around, I don't believe in what I'm teaching you, and it wasn't around that I don't believe it for me. But I would finish preaching, and it would come back like that. Well, that's your best effort? Well, that sure didn't move the needle. That didn't make any difference in anybody's life. The people don't, aren't believing that. I mean, it was relentless. It was relentless. Now, I, I got a handle on it enough to function, but it still kind of, 
It still kind of hung around. And then I'm a part of a pastor's fellowship group um, here in town. There's a lot of great pastors in our town. And, and a number of them have become friends. And um, I went in like any other time, about 30 of us, I went in. You know, I wasn't going to tell anybody in there anything. You don't tell pastors anything. <laughs> and uh, we come near the end of our time where we have some little bit of worship and some prayer together. And one of the guys uh, that leads that called me and two other guys into the middle of this group and said, I want to pray. We want to pray for Charlie and, and Keith and whatever. You guys come here and pray. And I was like, oh, great day. I'll never get out of here. He put his hand on my head, and the first words out of his mouth were, I cancel all of the plans of the enemy against Charlie today. Amen. I mean, I mean, it, it broke. I mean, I, I can't even explain to you. Because like I said, I, I was functioning again. I was functioning again. It was just still lingering. So I'd make a decision, and it went, I was afraid the decision wasn't a good decision. And then I would hear, you're a fraud. But I was functioning. But I'm telling you, when he laid his hand on my head and said, I cancel any assignment of the enemy on Charlie, something broke. That was probably only about four months ago. So I show up a couple weeks ago at, I, I, I didn't go to another one for months. And then I showed up last week at one. And again, just anonymous. I just go in, speak to the guys I know. Maybe me, I met a new guy. We talked. I ate. We're doing worship. I backed away from everybody else. I'm just kind of standing over here in worship. And the guy who leads the thing came over and spoke in my ear, the good ear. Um, and, and he said, hey, why don't you share a few words before we leave? And I knew immediately what I was going to say. Because I said, listen, guys, there's a lot of stuff we believe, and we believe we're the only ones who believe it. We keep it to ourselves. But I will tell you, God even knows when you keep it to yourself. And I looked at the one pastor, named Mark, and I said, Mark, you remember months ago where you put your hand on my head and you prayed for the cancel of any, enemy, any assignment of the enemy? He said, yep. He said, you have no idea what I had been through. But in that moment, it broke. And immediately another pastor said, Man, I'm so glad you told us because I've been praying for you every single day since that day, and I haven't known why. And now I know why. So what gives rise to a message about fake news and the lies we believe? The lies I believe. That doesn't mean because I believe them, you believe them, but I'm pretty much pretty sure that we're a lot alike. Chris, come on up. So again, although we're going to get into some specific lies, you need to know where these feelings are coming from. And you need to recognize the enemy's intent is to control you with them. But Christ's intent is to set us free. So I've dealt with self-worth issues my entire life. I can track them to where they came from, but I, I've dealt with it my entire life, which, which actually has been a good thing in some regards because I'm a type A driven perfectionist. So it's made me, it's made me maybe do more than I was capable of doing, if, if you get me right. But when I've told you before that I, um, it wasn't I loved winning as I hated losing, to go through life hating losing is a terrible way to go through life. You know why? Because you never enjoy the win. Because the next thing is just something, if you don't win, it just proves that you're a failure again. And so you're driven to win again because you don't want to feel like a failure, which means there's no joy in the winning. And, and after a while, you just get tired of the next thing. And this realization hit me this week. When you're so busy in life trying to prove your self-worth, you never get an opportunity to live your worth. When you spend 
every ounce of your energy continually trying to prove your self-worth, you never have the opportunity to live in your worth. Our worth will always be defined by the cross. Always. The cross is our constant. It is, it is a monument to the love and acceptance of God. Our worth. Worth, you just see currencies evaluate that bounce all over the place, right? But worth is always going to be what someone's willing to pay for it. It's, it's not the price tag on it. It's not how many slashes are through it. It doesn't. Worth is always determined by what someone is willing to pay for something. Your house. You think it's worth this? Someone's this? Someone's this? Worth, it's what, if you sell it for less, that's what it was worth. If you sell it for more, that's what it was worth. We were worth, not because of what we've done, because he determined our worth. He determines our worth. And everything that detracts from that is a lie. And if you don't wrestle that to the ground, it will haunt you the rest of your life. I know there's places of brokenness in all our hearts and God's put it together, but let's, let's, take, let's do our best to unroot the lies that have kind of broken up through that concrete of our lives that's causing all that stress fracture and everything else in our life. And here's how I just want to end. I want to pray for you. I want others to pray for you. I want them to put a hand on your head and say, we cancel the plans and the schemes of the enemy on this life. We, we, break, we break it so we can put it back together again. So Pastor Chris is going to sing in worship the song we ended with about coming to the Father. And if there was ever a Sunday that you decided to break out of your shell and come to an altar, it's this Sunday. Find a knee, stand up, spread out until someone comes and prays for you and puts a hand on your head and tells you, the authority of Christ. I'm commissioning a lot of prayers today. If you got someone you love up here and you know Jesus and you love Jesus, you come up and you put a hand on their head and in the authority of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we cancel the schemes of the enemy against this person. Paul tells us that our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty unto God to pulling down strongholds and anything that sets itself up against the truth of Christ take power and authority as brothers and sisters in Christ today in that prayer. So let's not mess around and sit and spend a lot of time figuring out if you're coming or not. If you've already thought about it, then just get out of that seat and come on. Now let's all stand up and we'll pray and then you're going to sing and you're going to come. In the name of Jesus, Father, collectively, I pray that prayer that we cancel the schemes and the plots of the enemy against these brothers and sisters in Christ today. Lord, that they, they've lived with it. They've lived with it too long. They're, they're ready for it to be over. And Lord, although we're going to have to still wrestle and strain and, uh, towards your truth, today we identify it. We identify it as lies. We speak to them as lies. And we pro proclaim truth in the name of Jesus. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see. My heart needs a surgeon, my 
soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again, again and again. You saw my condition I had a plan from the start Your son for redemption The price for my heart And I don't have a context For that kind of love I don't understand, I can't comprehend, I know I need you now. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. My heart has been in your sights long before my first breath. Running into your arms is running to life from death. And I feel this rush deep in my chest. Your mercy is calling out. Just as I am pulling me in, I know I need you now. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, the reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. A reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon. My soul found a friend. So I run to the Father. Again and again, again and again. You know, it's, it's interesting about, a, about the lies and how they work in a believer's life. Because, you know, I've been a follower of Christ a long time. I mean, I'm not a spring chicken. Um, and and where, where I would never doubt my worth in a sense of my understanding of the cross, it, it, the way it manifests in my life would, would be much more, yeah, 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 God loves you, but. There would there'd just be a lot of buts in there. Yeah, I know he loves you, but this, this is never going to happen. Or, yeah, you know, he, you know I, I, he loves you, but this is too big for you. God, God's, God's love has no buts. God's power has no buts. God's ability to bring about that which he puts in your heart has no buts. So 
sometimes, sometimes you're going to hear a lie in your own head like I did, like I have. Sometimes someone's going to say something or something's not going to turn out the way you think, and then that's going to, that's going to, prompt, that's going to prompt a lie. Like this is, this is all it's ever going to be. Or I'll, it'll never be this way again. This can't ever be fixed. One of the other, one of the, the observations I had in, in writing this was that as a Christian, I don't get everything right. But the, the, the mark of Christianity is not that I get everything right. The mark of Christianity is that I make things right. You see the difference? Because the gospel is around the, 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 the prefix re, again, redemption, reconciliation. But things can be redeemed. That if I don't get it right, I can make it right. That, that's more a mark of a Christian. The reconciliation, the redemption. The best thing God does is resurrections. And the best thing the enemy wants to make us believe is that we're so dead, there isn't any life left. That's, that's the lie. And nothing stays dead long when it's around Jesus. I've got one more thing to do. I, I know I'm over time, but I've got one more thing to do before we leave. And I need you to just hang with me one moment. Peterson family, come on up. Grab, grab that microphone over there. Um, it was my, my, Gina and my, come on, baby. Gina and my first um, encounter with Nikki was in 1993, and she was, what year were you would have been in 1993? A freshman in high school, and I was their new student pastor. And um, Nikki became uh, our go-to. Nikki was our favorite. I can say that now because they're all, they have kids of their own now growing up. And Nikki was my favorite. And, and then it wasn't long after that, I came in contact with Daniel. He's really never been my favorite. <laughs> We were quite jealous early on about their relationship. But no, but Daniel, very, very shortly after that, became kind of a go-to for me and has been for decades. I mean, you need to figure something out. Daniel was the call. And then in 2006, when we left Mount Perrin, um, know this, this is important. We knew that God was telling us to go somewhere, and we didn't know what he was telling us to do. But because of my relationship with the pastor, I told him anyway. Pastor, I don't know what God's telling us to do. I just know it's not here. And I know that that's hard to hear, and I love you. And my pastor and I are still close friends. But in 2006, Daniel was the first to come to my house and say, God's calling, God's calling us to go with you and Gina to Plant Gateway. We believe something's big for us in our future, and we know if we can't even do this, we can't do the other. And I'm telling you, Gateway exists. There's a lot, been a lot of hands to this plow, okay? But Nikki and Daniel has filled every hole there's ever been here. They've both been children's pastors. Yeah, a couple of times. It's like, I mean, and and so. So it's with, it's with excitement, but a heavy heart. It's excitement that I say that Daniel had to have a conversation with me that I had with my pastor 13 years ago. Charlie, I love you, and I love this place. But God's saying there's something else. They came on a two-year commitment. We've been on a decade of having one-year re-ups. And this time, I think they mean it. I love this family dearly. We prayed for these two kids when they were in the neonatal unit when I had to put my hands in a box to pray for them. The good thing here is the relationship is as strong as it's ever been. The bad news is that I won't be able to see him and take his handkerchief on a Sunday morning as regular. They're going to be around here for about a month or so. Um, but then they don't know what God has, but they really believe that until they let go, they, wasn't, they weren't going to hear from God for the next. And so this is our letting go. I've had, I've had, we've had about a month to process it. So I'm over my, all the stages of grief. If you know what they are, anger is one of them, right? So, so, 
I don't, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I don't, I don't promise, I'll save that with the others. I don't promise, I don't promise that I won't cycle back to those, but um, I think Daniel or Nikki want to say a few words and then we want to bless them. We're going to bless them in prayer and you'll have ample opportunity to love on them um, over the next several weeks. Um. Yeah, I know Charlie's already covered our history, but um, I wouldn't be who I am today without them in my life. And I love you both so much. I just want you to know, Gina allowed me to step into women's Bible study when I was 22. Well, if she pushed me into leading women's Bible study, I was 22 and the other women at the table were in their 40s and 50s and 60s and she saw something in me. Truly, thank you for pushing me. Charlie, thank you for making me pray out loud, teaching me all the things. This place, I came wanting to do the thing, wanting to plan a church. And about three months into actually planning, I looked at them. I said, I never expected to love the people this much. It took me by surprise how much all of you got into my heart and said thank you for letting me fall in love with all of you thank you for letting me pour into you and minister to you and serve alongside of you thank you for loving my children and growing them into who they are and thank you for loving us and letting us love you I just sorry we're gonna miss y'all terribly I went to bed last night with <laughs> I went to bed last night with no idea of what I wanted to say this morning. I laid in bed for an hour and thought about Googling what you should say when you're leaving the church. Um, and I woke up this morning with no idea of what to say this morning. And but then I sat down here at the beginning of the service and I looked at this space up here and it all came back to me. Uh, I've been sitting right here in one of these three or four seats for six or seven, I don't know how many years we've been in this building, for three reasons. One, I, I get easily distracted, so I don't want to sit back there and look at the back of people's heads. I like to sing loud, but I don't have a great voice, so I don't want any of you to have to hear my voice in your ear. And thirdly, I like to be near the altar. Um, in a larger sanctuary, if, if you were always every Sunday morning six feet from the altar, people would think you were really weird. Um, but here, because the, the room's smaller and the rows are closer, I get to basically sit in the altar every Sunday morning. And I was just looking at this area right here. In the pulpit, and I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity to preach from this pulpit right here with no credentials and without asking, with Charlie asking to pre-approve my message, but that I was trusted and I thank you for that. In this space right here. There's two or three instances in the last few years where God has done an amazing, miraculous work in my life because I just took two or three steps up right here. And so thank you for listening 13 years ago and allowing us to come with you guys and building this place and making this possible for us. We love you. We, I've told a couple of people you know, we made this decision a few weeks ago. I told a couple of people that I'm already having leavers remorse. You know, if when you were in middle school or high school and you broke up with someone and then you saw them the next day and they were looking good. <laughs> and like the last few weeks, you guys have been looking good. <laughs> but I know, I know. This place is in great hands. There's great leadership here underneath Charlie and Gina and the staff. And there's an, an unbelievable season coming just right behind that wall. I wish this didn't have to come down and get turned into a wall or a classroom because this means a lot to me right here. 
But if you guys will please be praying for our family. We won't be strangers and we love you. Amen. Thank you. Before I pray, let me just say this. Do you want to say anything? Um, you can attest this. We would have never dreamed this 13 years ago, right? I mean, we, we knew God would have a church. It would be here. We had no, we had no idea what it would feel like, right, and, and how special it was. And, um, and that same thing is waiting you guys. Yeah, that's what I thought about this morning. We couldn't have seen this when I said, Mark, Pastor Mark, I, it's time to go, and I don't want to leave you. You're my friend. And, but this is just, I can't get away from it. We would have never dreamed. This morning, that's what I woke up thinking about you guys. I knew probably the hardest call was calling me to tell me what was happening. But we bless you in the name of Jesus. And we are so excited that that move here is precipitating this move there, wherever that is. And it's going to be, it's going to be unbelievable. It doesn't have to be grandiose, right? It just has to be unbelievable. Something we couldn't figure out now is what it's going to be. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray for our friends, our fellow pastors, people have poured into us, and we are so unbelievably grateful, Lord, for the deposit of them in our lives. And Lord, we bless them with everything within us, believing wholly, Lord, that they, they are trustworthy, that they are following you. Lord, way back, you wouldn't even tell Abraham where to go. You just needed him to go. And Father, this is a going family. And we're grateful that they've came. And Lord, we're grateful that we get to stand also when they go. Thank you for their relationship. Thank you for their ministry. May you pour out resources, vision, and dreams, and blessing, and partnership more than they would have ever thought or imagined. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 If you're a guest with us today, I promise we won't do that next week. The hard part is I got to do that again in about another hour and a half. Um, but right outside these double doors under this big sea, there we have a gift for you. We'd love to have you. I'd uh, love to meet you there. Now for our benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up, you're laying down, you're going out, and you're coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. See you next week.